What a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty. In form and moving how express and admirable. In action how like an angel, in apprehension how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Hamlet Act 2, Scene 2, This bloated, rotten carcass of an empire is driven not by reason and hope, but by fear, hate and ignorance. Rob out Gilliman, who is not pleased by the actual state of the Imperium. The Imperium of Man is a huge gigantic galactic civilization and empire to give you an idea of how truly massive this empire is. The most conservative estimates place its population at 4 quadrillion. Estimates that take into account the huge number of what are essentially cramped apartment building planets. Now we're talking upwards of 40 quadrillion. Oh, and this is not counting planets they have lost track of due to various heresies and other catastrophes that contains the vast majority of humanity in the tabletop game Warhammer 40k. It is often stereotyped in popular media as a xenophobic, amoral, gargantuan, militaristic, merciless, stratified, theocratic, paranoid, dystopian, totalitarian, semi-police state and hellishly oligarchical bureaucracy. Why this is called stereotypical to begin with is questionable though since it's absolutely fucking true but think of a hideous amalgamation of the Roman Empire, pre-reformation Catholic Church, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia and George Orwell's 1984 spread out across the stars, under constant attack by aliens and subject to countless disasters every day. Add in the fanatical worship of a dead dictator and it's basically North Korea in space. However, this is what GW wants you to think, in all retrospective outside of the popular perspective, the Imperium of Man can actually be a pretty nice place to live depending on where you actually live, although GW description does apply to death worlds, some hive worlds and the Imperium as a whole. Sure, there are shitholes like Catalgen, but because of its size and extreme variety, you also have a higher chance of being born in places that shits all over any modern developed country and may even be led by people better than Gandhi. While it's plausible that atrocities happen all the time in the Imperium, given its size, that doesn't mean that everyone is always doomed. Unfortunately Games Workshop decided to ignore this aspect since it is not metal and grim derp enough, and thus does not help with sales. Almost everything 40k related and homebrewed on this website is a sterling example of TG taking creative liberties with what the Imperium stands for. These include, but are not limited to, the Angry Marines, Commissar Reach, Commissar Fucklaw, Pretty Marines, Reasonable Marines, Truly, Anonymous Delivers, The Aquila, the symbol of the Imperium and personal heraldry of the God Emperor of Mankind, failing to show proper reverence to the Aquila's heresy punishable by blaming. The two heads represent looking towards the future while being blind towards the mistakes of the past, while the two heads and differing feet represent the Terra Mars Alliance. Synopsis. The Imperium consists of over a million habitable worlds and is of such size that the loss of a few dozen planets along with billions of citizens is not even worth the paperwork it would take to declare said world's perditus. Under constant threat and attack by a myriad of powerful alien races and traitorous forces, the Imperium is engulfed in a constant galaxy-spanning war. The everyday rule of the Imperium is left to the High Lords of Terror, who basically don't give a fuck about anybody and have no clue what the hell they're doing half of the time. The figurehead and subject of compulsory religious veneration, the immortal god emperor of mankind forged the Imperium out of the Age of Strife. Being physically fucked for the past 10,000 years, he sits immobile and connected to the Golden Throne far from the sight of his subjects. Witnessed his formerly glorious utopia of science and reason drop 99.9% .9 of its IQ points against his will, and requires the sacrifice of men as sick as a day to keep him alive. Though this hasn't prevented his body from decomposing he still has some fleshy bits left and now looks like a mummy without the wrappings. Heresy is the greatest crime one can commit in the Imperium. The punishment for which is a painful death or torture followed by a painful death. Technology is barely understood and basically mythological, and even the Tetch priests are afraid of their machines this aspect of the Tetch priests has been lessened over the years. Now they are more like spiritualistic and very dogmatic scientists rather than technoizards. The Imperium is also one of the biggest entities in the 40k universe, like a fat guy that hogs half the couch for himself and forces the others to sit on the armrests. Some far TGUYS theorize that if the Imperium falls it may take the rest of the galaxy with it. As it holds so much territory that it staves off the Tyranids and the Orcs before they can nom loot everyone else's shit. 
For example Dawn of War II, Spice Marines nuke the Tyranid fleet before they can nom an Elder Craft World. It's now a complete shithole and is not even remotely close to the Emperor's vision for humanity. Reasons for this include the Imperium's leaders being heartless fuckwards and the necessity of such an uncaring organization for the survival of humanity in a galaxy that wants to kill them in a million painful ways. That's fucking grimdark, but at least there's slanish to lighten everything you ballam. This article's author has been seized by the local authorities for heresy. Please report all known contacts and co-conspirators to your local commissar. You may resume reading this article with an approved author. Well, honestly, Nurgle is at least a pretty nice goobalum. This article's approved author has been seized by the local authorities for heresy. Please again, report all known contacts and co-conspirators to your local commissar. You may resume reading this article with an even more approved author. Well, at least we have Tsi Balam. This article's approved author has been seized by the local authorities for heresy. Please again, report all known contacts and co-conspirators to your local commissar. You may resume reading this article with an even more approved author. Kobalam. This article's approved author has been seized by the local authorities for heresy. Please again, report all known contacts and co-conspirators to your local commissar. You may resume reading this article with an even more approved author. And for fuck's sake please stop mentioning the Charbalam. The Iron Men are credited with fucking humanity right over, just like the old ones did with the rest of the galaxy's inhabitants. This would never happen. Ever. At least, not where anyone could see it. Rob out Gilliman and M42. With the events of Gathering Storm and the Dark Imperium, the awakening of Big Blue Wonder Rush and sweeping changes within the governmental ruling of the Imperium, Rob out self-coronation as Lord Commander his old job and political reforms that meant the firing of some High Lords of Terror meant that the arm is becoming more centralized like it was during the Great Crusade. Of course, centralization means a more authoritarian Imperium. Nevertheless, Gilliman is the best living person to be given the responsibility in fixing the bureaucratic nightmare of the Imperium, so there is little reason to panic. One of the biggest reasons the vast majority of the Imperial Guard spends entire careers fighting rebelling worlds instead of humanity's enemies is because each planet is highly autonomous and their governments simply blame the Imperium for the hardships caused by the greed of those world's nobles and governors. So, an Imperium with greater authority and control over its worlds would increase efficiency and effectiveness of planetary governments and the Imperium's usual inefficient methods. Then the 80% of Imperial Guard forces fighting rebels can go banhammer aliens and demons instead. Some including the High Lords themselves. To the surprise of nobody consider Robout's rule as a dictatorship not like they can honestly stop him since he has a blood claim to the throne and effectively controls all space marines and custodes. But the reality is that whilst the Imperium is centralizing in a manner akin to how it was in the Great Crusade, certain political entities such as the Ekelshiarchy and the Inquisition still hold significant clout and influence over the Imperium, with Gilliman currently updating his new Codex Imperialis for good governance and ruling. It is safe to say that the quality of life for the Imperium will be slowly improving, of course. The vastness and sheer diversity of the arm combined with the unwillingness of the above mentioned political entities to accept reform means that the actual results are far more complicated than this. Nonetheless, the very fact that Gilliman's rule is actively trying to improve the Imperium with mixed results shows that the Imperium unlike traditional oppressive regimes still have a chance for the better. It would still be the Imperium we know and love, but it would be far more efficient and competent. Since efficiency and competency was the biggest crutch on why the Imperium is in such a dire situation, resistance to Gilliman's reforms would most likely be met by a visit from loyal inquisitors and the inquisitors who plot against his reforms would probably be vanished by raven guards sent by Gilliman. Anyone in the way of his plans would simply disappear or end up mysteriously dead. Primarchs are not known for taking shit or for accepting no as an answer to their orders. Furthermore, it seems that the jingoistic foreign policy of the Imperium towards Xenos for 10,000 years has relaxed slightly in favor of pragmatism on Robby's part, most exemplified by the current alliance of convenience between the Imperium and the Innery it's hard to say exactly how sincere the relationship is. Gilliman himself noted that the Innery could be respected but not necessarily trusted, and the Visarchus voiced criticism of Ivrain acting as a lapdog of the Imperium. So while they're not fighting each other they can hardly be called the best of friends. However, it has been suggested that Big Bobby G and Ivrain are totally hot for each other and want to have crazy butt yes. Oh not again. Balam heresy. 
It could also be due to the giant warp scar spawned from Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade and how chaos is now a bigger threat to the Imperium than ever. Forces of the Imperium. Adeptus Custodes, the Emperor's personal bodyguards who make space marines look like ordinary men. Their armor has so much bling it makes even the most pimptastic space marines artificer armor look cheap. Their modification and training, not to mention the loss of the Emperor, robbed most of them of empathy and the ability to form connections with other people even each other. As the only being they trusted absolutely is now stuck between life and death. Others are quite reasonable guys, and after 10,000 years on the bench, and a minor demon invasion of holy terror, they are back in the game in a big way. Anyway, they go to insane lengths and cross any moral line to ensure his safety, and are now going forth on crusade to help guard humanity as a whole from unending terror. Grimdark, Space Marines, the enhanced, power-armored super soldiers who form the elite warriors of the Imperium. All they do is train, sleep, pray, fight, and die, and they love every second of it being the loyal warrior monks they are. There are only a million of them, but since the Imperium only has about a million planets it kind of evens out. They are no longer human, and remember nothing but an endless service of bloodshed culminating in their own violent deaths. Grimdark, Imperial Guard, the countless quadrillions of regular humans who form the vast majority of the Imperium's armed forces. Very similar to a conventional modern military, they are a bunch of manly farmers and factory workers fighting off unstoppable robots with guns that completely rip their skin off. Huge monstrous aliens who want to om nom nom everything, batchet insane superhumans who want to kill everyone in painful ways and sacrifice their victim souls while doing it. Barbaric aliens who are made for fighting and winning, mysterious spes pansies who don't give a shit about anyone else, spes elves who want to torture and rape them with the worst forms of BDSM. Orwellian weeaboo space communists, or obscure but brutal spider who reptiles that like to rip your intestines out before stealing all your stuff, with little more than a flashlight, reinforced cardboard, standard issue chest hair and balls o steel, or that's what you might be led to believe. A big part of the Imperium's wars are fought against fellow humans or things that once were human but decided they had enough of being crapped upon by greedy superiors and uncaring leaders. Most Imperial Guardsmen are conscripted every now and then from the best planetary defense force troopers on a given world. Some planets supplement this supply with prisoners, while others give over their entire population to the Imperium as their tithe, the birth rate equaling the recruitment rate. Most die or muster out and they will never again see home, unless they are fighting on it. Grimdark, die horribly or join the guard and then die horribly. At least that way you'll get a sweet looking flashlight. Adeptus Mechanicus, an organization of tech priests. They have a monopoly over all Imperial technology from giant mecha to cybernetics, and almost everyone else in the Imperium is afraid of their machines. As a result, the Abmech is to loan their tech priests to other organizations in the form of Ingenseers. Though for Space Marines it's more a work-study program as they'll send one of their own troops to become a Tech Marine. Independent scientists also exist, but only as long as they don't get killed for heresy or stay below the Mechanicus radar. Once these independents get powerful or competent enough to make a difference, they get wiped out or absorbed into Cult Mechanicus. Includes Adeptus Titanicus, Legio Cybernetica Insidious Death Robotics, Inc., Centurio Ordinatus Look at Name. Figure it out, Skaterii basically Imperial Guard of the Mechanicus. Auxilia Myrmidon Tech Priest War Savants, Stuff of Nightmares, and the Ordo Reductus Siege Specialists, infamous for ripping off the Space Marines by making the Thalux. Grimdark, Imperial Navy, job is pretty self-explanatory, they split with the Guard after the Horus Heresy. They are a very large organization, as you would expect from a navy tasked with protecting a million worlds. Their ships range in size from meters long fighters to kilometers long battleships which are quite capable of blowing up planets, mostly imperial ones. Which they do at the command of the Inquisition on a regular basis in the fight against heresy. Because humanity was ass raped by I 15,000 years ago, the Imperial Navy uses huge human crews, most of which are recruited that is shanghai to die in space as one of billions of expendable men. Grimmed up, considering not even some hydraulic lifters are employed when reloading even though the rest of the ship is high tech. Adeptus Arbites, these guys police every world in the Imperial. They're like Judge Red but more grimdark. Arbites are usually one of the first institutions to be set up on a world and are equipped to fight a small war. With equipment ranging from power malls and suppression shields to lasguns and even the lemon rus. On the ground the Arbites have four unit patrol groups, 
whose job it is to make sure no wrongdoing occurs in the settlement, shock troops who are sent in when there are riots, street wars and other generalized disturbances they usually shoot on sight if you are anywhere near the problem center. Execution teams who pursue specific guilty individuals or groups, and snatch squads who are charged with capturing a specific individual or group for questioning. The criminals caught by the Arbites usually wind up dead one way or another. The Inquisition often uses the Arbites to apprehend certain individuals if they do not wish to be directly involved. Grimdark, Inquisition, the KGB of the Imperium. Their job is to keep said Imperium secure and loyal. With jurisdiction over nearly anyone and anything, the Inquisitors and their agents have very few impediments on their endless quest to contain heresy. The Inquisition consists of three main branches the Ordo Hereticus, whose duty is to eliminate or contain threats such as heresy, mutants, and traitors. The Ordo Xenos, who specialize in destruction of alien threats, and the Ordo Malias who are called on to stop demonic incursions. If they do their job poorly, entire worlds get destroyed based on the barest rumors. Alternatively, if they do their jobs well, those worlds still get destroyed because there are no other alternatives to stop the many genocidal threats the Imperium faces. Also, nobody expects them, Grimdark, the Inquisition not as easy as it looks. Sisters of Battle, the Ekel Shiaki's army, the nuns with guns or Bolter bitches. Originally, they were an isolated all-female cult on a backwater world, and subsequently became the personal army of Goj Vandar during his fab age of apostasy. After that blew over, they came into their current role through some top-notch rules lawyering after the age of apostasy, the Ekelshiaki was only barred from having men under arms. So the sisters weren't disbanded. They are trained from early age because they are picked up as orphans and in the end they become one of the best fighting troops of the Imperium, second only to the Astartes themselves. Their faith is so great that even Grey Knights are jealous of it. TG likes to see sisters and different heretical fantasies, often involving Slanesh, female T.A.U. and elder Farseers. But what the poor bastards don't know is that the sisters are all into celibacy though some law says otherwise, love only the emperor sometimes it's a damn shame, and are so zealous and fanatical that they would turn off just about any human man anyway. Armed with their trusty bolters, meltagons and flamers the holy trinity of weaponry as far as they're concerned, they go around the galaxy and kick chaos renegades Xenosas as much as they can. Grimdark, Death Watch, if you're an especially skilled space marine, or if your chapter just wants to get rid of you, the Death Watch is always looking for new recruits to train into even more hyper-efficient Xenos killing machines. Acting on behalf of the Ordo Xenos. Recruits get hypno-indoctrinated with endless videos of battle brothers getting slaughtered by all manner of Xenos until they become frothing angry and need to be physically restrained. Instead of organizing into large task forces, the Death Watch fights in small special forces kill teams to complete specific objectives and kick ass. Some of its members deliberately obscure or renounce their past ties and become black shields, permanently joining the Death Watch until death claims them. Grimdark. Grey Knights. You thought space marines were bad dudes? Well loyal citizen, grey knights are super space marines who are very interested in your heretical google image searches. They function as the military arm of the Ordomilius. In a galaxy and time where literal demons from space hell can punch through reality and turbo slaughter whole sectors, the grey knights are the final word in supernatural defense. This was especially important since for over 10,000 years, there were no good primarches around to fight the blasphemous ascended being of the weak. Every bit of armor, weapon, training and gear they have is top of the line, and nigh irreplaceable. When they fight, a psychic shroud inhibits the psychic powers of whoever they are fighting, and they have psychic nemesis force we are Christ. I can't go on, this shit is bananas. Ignore Matt Ward's bullshit, stop making shitty references to zero punctuation, and finish the damn article. Psychic psychic bendy spoons. Aside from their anti-anti-anti-chaos gear, Grey Knights aren't typically who you send to stop a cult, they're the guys you send to clean up a chaos-defiled planet with boiling oceans, poisonous air, psychedelic skies, and more bones than living people on them, grimdark, and yet, no Grey Knight has ever fallen to chaos. Which is awesome. Officio Assassinorum, the coolest and scariest men and women in the Imperio, whose job it is to kill people. While one would think this would overlap with the duties of every other Imperial organization, it is different because the Assassinorum trained spies and assassins to be more subtle, such as manipulating people to do your dirty work while totally not aware you are behind it, except when they train batchet insane aversa assassins. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a paradox. 
leaving no survivors to tell the tale is a subtlety all in itself. Grimdark. Sisters of Silence. The Militantdom of the Astra Telepathica. They are all blanks and refuse to speak but are deadly enough to take down any sicker threat and to travel with the likes of Lemon Russ and the Custodes. As you can imagine they feature in some pretty badass artwork but sadly have very little work dedicated to them. It is unknown if they survived the end of the Great Crusade but there have been no indications to the contrary. Given that the Inquisition and Kilexus Temple exist their role is partly redundant. But may be justified in that by being under the direct authority of the branch that deals with Sickers it allows a faster and more standardized way of handling Sickers. Plus neither zealous assault forces or assassins would exactly fit the job description. Grimdark. With the return of Gilliman to the Imperium we now know that the sisters did indeed survive, and considering how bad the state of the galaxy is due to the Gree Rift, their job has become way I, 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 I busier than ever before. Other organizations. Administratum. The pencil pushers of the Imperium. Complete with bureaucrats so devoted to their trade that they treated like a religion, and massive inefficiency. They regulate the Imperial Guard and the Imperial Navy, dictate and assess the tithes all worlds in the Imperium are required to pay to Holy Terror, and administer how those things get used. Their archives are so big and so full that if you search anything in them, you'll die wrapped in endless layers of red tape, if you're not accompanied by an adept. Grimdark. Ekelshayaki. The Imperial Church which works with the Inquisition to regulate the worship of the Emperor and define what counts as heresy. Basically priests with flammer throws and mega chainsaws. It also oversees the Sisters of Battle and the Scholar Progenium, and works closely with the Ordo Hereticus. Often has a complicated relationship with the other members branches of the Imperium Space Marines insisting that the Emperor was a human, the Administratum for overall control of the Imperium, the Adeptus Mechanicus worshipping a deity that should be the Emperor or not, etc. Grimdark. Adeptus Astra Telepathica, the organization charged with maintaining the Imperium's vast network of Sickers, who are necessary for faster than light travel and keeping the Emperor alive on the Golden Throne. Their members are oftentimes forcibly conscripted children who have just barely survived being lynched on their home world, and were lucky enough not to be mulched into Emperor food or Astronomican fuel. Even so, the process to become a sanctioned sicker is physically and emotionally scaring, and can still lead to a grisly death via explosion, possession, or just losing complete control of your sanity. Grimdark. Adeptus Astronomican, the organization charged with maintaining the light of the Astronomican, the psychic beacon for traveling through the warp, sacrifices a loads of sickers every day to keep the Astronomican running and literally the only thing keeping the entire Imperium from winking out like a candle. Grimdark. Imperial Knights. The Imperial Knights are the lords of feudalistic worlds where the rulers and the military forces are one and the same, piloting massive combat measure into battle to defend their worlds or to aid the Imperium, usually have strong ties to the Adeptus Mechanicus. Grimdark. Squats, a dwarvish race of technologically advanced up humans descended from mining colonists on high gravity planets. Their worlds are the only other independent Imperial worlds besides Admech's Mars. Their forces complemented that of the Adeptus Mechanicus and the Imperial Guard, with a tendency towards giant-sized war machines. Their populations are now greatly diminished due to various reasons. Grimdark. Reasons it sucks to live in the Imperial. Call no man happy until he is dead. Thought for the day. Also Aeschylus. Imperial Guard generals are some of the sexiest men alive, and the worst part is that almost all of them are celibate lies, all the lies, on an unrelated note. This is one of General Castor's earlier designs. The High Lords of Terror are brutal and manipulative. The Adeptus Arbites make Judge Red seem reasonable. Thinking about nothing is the only way to survive, unless you think about the steely musculature and long, shimmering hair of the Emperor. The hive world you almost certainly live on is an overcrowded shithole where being able to breathe non-recycled air is a luxury. Thinking about nothing implies your thinking, and thinking is heresy. You are constantly under attack by orcs, elder, tyrannids, dark elder, the forces of chaos, space communists, etc. If you mutate, you will be at best shunned, but most likely killed, and even death is not the worst case scenario. Voices in your sleep keep telling you that chaos is great, at which point an inquisitor kills you whether you resist the temptations or not. Priests keep telling you the Imperium is great and then report you for not attending the entirety of your third mass service of the designated planetary worship day, at which point you are executed by local law enforcement. If you are in the navy you are in the Imperial Guard. 
Which means you will either die painfully on the battlefield or be executed by a commissar for not being loyal enough to die on the battlefield. Seriously, many worlds hold your funeral the day before departure, people mourn your passing while you are standing next to them, and you are considered to be already dead. Your planetary governor is incompetent, ruthless, heretical or just very greedy if you're lucky. Any that aren't are rarer than an orc that doesn't wag, and either dead or about to be killed by one or more of the Imperium's enemies or someone else from the Imperium. Even if you do win the war via sheer hard work, chances are that you are sterilized and shipped to a labor camp because you might have the taint of chaos. And killed. Your whole life consists of working your ass off with no hope of social advancement, unless you're a noble, in which case nothing in this list applies to you anyway. You can be executed for taking incorrect care of your gun and angering the machine spirit. And that assumes the machine spirit doesn't kill you first. Loyalist space marines never get laid, Eve Ballam. This article's approved author has been seized by the local authorities for heresy. Please again, report all known contacts and co-conspirators to your local commissar. You may resume reading this article with an even more approved author. If you happen to be an inquisitor, you are expected to watch whatever you order. Vomiting is heresy. Technology scares you. Not much of a change, though is it? You are poor and uneducated. Isn't a change, either. If and when you die, the chances that anyone will ever give a shit about your death are nearly non-existent. Again, nor much of a change there either. The orcs might eventually reunite and destroy the Imperium. The Necrons will eventually awaken and might destroy the Imperium. Chaos cannot be defeated and will probably destroy the Imperium sooner or later. Tyranids are pouring in from nearly all sides of the galaxy and will probably destroy the Imperium through the power of Omnum. If you're not dead in the Guard, dead in the Navy, very dead in the PDF, or dead as a civilian, you're a heretic and alien sympathizer. Therefore executed, and therefore dead. The Imperium routinely cleanses Xeno species. So if you're a wandering Elder Craft world or even a minor Xenos race on a conquered planet expect no sympathy or even a quick death. Independence is non-existent, and the Imperium has even destroyed two perfectly healthy, anti-chaos empires called Adranthus V and Interrex which had incredible technological riches and a way to resist chaos. Whoops. The first was due to a misidentification by overeager Imperial psychotic killers, the second was a civilization combined with one that created chaos artifacts. Sure, totally not chaos despite making chaos artifacts. Right. Incompetence is also non-existent, and if you show competence, you are imbued by the chaos gods and therefore executed for heresy. Thinking any model is sexy is obvious heresy. And let's not even get started on what it's like if you're on the wrong side of the Great Rift. However, is the Imperium really that bad? Because the only way to keep a stagnating empire alive is with excessive force R. But where's the Roman Empire now? Also. Note the walking cathedral several miles in the background that's still bigger than the banner blade at the front. However, as said before, if you excuse GW's initial promotion that life in the Imperium must be tough and dark, then average life in the Imperium for the common Joe is for all intents and purposes, uncomfortable and highly unpleasant, but ultimately tolerable for its people as opposed to those of us in M3 who would likely lack the temperament or the constitution to do well in such a life. This can be further explained below. The reality of the Imperium, throughout WH40K. Nearly every single grimdark example in the fluff is shown through the narrative perspective of either space marines and inquisitors whose primary job is to fight against WTF horror eldritch, abominations and genocidal aliens for every single day of their lives, or of criminals, crooks and scum such as those living within the darkest pits in hive worlds like Necromunda. Of which. There are only about 32,000 and something hundreds in ratio to the several hundreds of thousands of civilized worlds which are the planetary majority in the Imperium. The odds of being born in a desolated dump is actually quite low, and if you are born there, the only thing you need to be wary of are gang fights and mutants. And that's only if you are dumb enough to venture in the underhive or unlucky enough to be born poor there the poor can still get labor jobs in Manufactoria or wherever else or enlist in the PDF. And such, worlds are never lacking for jobs needing filling or soldiers to hold the fort. Life as a middle class imperial which are the majority in hive worlds is often plain and simple if boring and repetitive with your average wage. Average working job and with your average necessities in life such as TV level of propaganda vary or food might be artificially processed. And since there is always a demand for workers at some level, unemployment ratios would actually be quite small unlike real life. 
You don't have to fear automation and new technologies taking your job and the Imperium always needs more menial laborers. If you're in the Imperial Guard, the chances of being sent into an eternal meat grinder is actually quite slim, if the Imperium's size and speed is taken into perspective. Although some policies within the Imperium would be regarded as immoral or crimes against humanity in today's world, take note that what the Imperium does is a necessary evil. They know what they're doing is morally questionable, but they have to do it since they have no other choice and in the grim setting of WH-40K. This is the only solution to be dealt with for the betterment of humanity as a whole. Unlike every single other being in the entire setting, the Imperium actually knows its necessary evils are evil and bemoans this fact but grits its teeth and does it anyway. Determined to make sure what was done has meaning and was never in vain. This is why, outside of mainstream sci-fi where we see aliens or some entities destroying a planet full of people for no other reason but for the evils, in the Imperium, you see none of that, as in their point of view. To destroy a planet without a justified cause is seen as incredibly wasteful and sinful as you are technically wasting the Emperor's resources which, ironically enough, can lead to you getting executed, so it's something most people try to avoid. There is even a small order of the Inquisition whose job is to investigate exterminatus planet boom events and determine whether or not it was justified. Foreign Policy on Xenos for those that complain of the Imperium's genocidal stance against aliens especially prior to the Emperor getting stuck on the Golden Throne, remember that during Humanity's earlier years, virtually every Xeno they encountered were either genocidal dickheads or sadistic assholes, so can you really blame them? Take for example, the Craft World Elder. On the surface, they may seem benign and offer their hand in friendship. Just so you are the ones who walk into a Necron tomb world and lose millions where they could have done the same and possibly only lost a few hundred. Regardless, this is easier said than done and they prioritize hostile races over occasional allies. Add to that, Big E wanted an atheistic empire starving the chaos gods out with science all without falling into men of iron eye. Revenge of the machines, and those Xenos that weren't deeply religious and or sick as tended to go the AI way. So in order to avoid any unnecessary questions and unhealthy curiosity, he basically got a standing order to purge everything on site in place. Said order was duly followed during the Great Crusade proper, but now that the expansion is over, it is applied much less zealously. Overall, the tolerance of Xenos vary on their threat to humanity in the first place. Mostly since the Imperium does have not enough resources to even deal with those that possess an actual threat hence why Orc Caridon and Sortek Necron Empires flourish. And no new crusades are sent to bring down the TAU, despite all three being almost next door to Ultramar. If the Imperium encounters another alien civilization that's only interested in trade and does not pose an obvious threat, then the Imperium although still strictly supervised by the Inquisition will trade to a certain extent, via diplomacy. Put in the fact of the Imperium's I don't disturb you and you don't disturb me policy to outsiders. With the fact that there are actually a lot of Xenos living within multiple Imperium worlds contrary of popular opinion, and the fact that the majority of the wars that humanity has fought was on the defense than the offense of course this depends wholeheartedly on the Imperium's mood in the first place. You would then realize that on a whole, the Imperium is actually tolerant insofar as it doesn't destroy Xenos races right away if they aren't an immediate threat. An excellent way to understand the Imperium's policies to Adalians is seen in the The War of the Beast novel series, as it portrays some Xenos sympathizers and populations subjected to them. Ultimately, with threats like Chaos, Genus Tealers, and countless other malevolent forces at large in the galaxy, the Imperium's intolerance is born of crucial necessity, with the xenophobia growing out of it as a byproduct. The Imperium cannot afford to be accepting of alien influence and ideas, because you just never know what might be sneaking in with it, and they learned that through painful experience. What might be dismissed as innocent and inconsequential can and often does lead to the downfall of entire worlds. The only reason the TAU can act like they can openly befriend the whole galaxy is because they are naively unaware of all of what's out there and what they're potentially inviting in and run the risk of learning the same lessons the Imperium did the hard way. That much has been pointed out by both Farsight and Cyphus Kane. Even with all the above, the Imperium is focused on survival above all else, and if that means working with Xenos they may very well do so. Rob out Gilliman can testify to that, given that said Xenos played a major role in his revival. Besides all of this, the Imperium isn't going around just blaming every species even when it can for a simple reason the Imperium is not evil. The Imperium is not a murderer, it is not insane, and it tries to be honorable as much as is feasible. 
Killing a species when it is unnecessary is murder and is definitely dishonorable. The Imperium is a civilization, and is as civilized as it can be in the reality it finds itself in. They hate all aliens, even those whom they have accepted as protectorates, allies, neutral, or simply we live on the same planet, don't mess with us and we won't kill you. However, the Imperium understands the difference between understandable hatred and actually acting on that hatred against beings whose extermination is not necessary. Heck, there are plenty of people whoever is reading this might hate, but you don't go around kill them, do you? Exactly. Governmental ideological structure. Additionally, while the Imperium, as referenced above, looks like a merciless and oppressive empire, it is in fact a confederation of several powerful organizations and a million planets. It occupies a strange place in between libertarian paradise as planets have a fair bit of autonomy, more than GW would like to admit and oppressive theocracy. As shown all over this page as the Imperium's main policy for what a world is under their control is pay the tithe, send your sickers over when the black ships show up. And don't make me come over there, each normal planet in the Imperium besides specially classified planets like Forge Worlds, Fortress Worlds, Death Worlds, has its own laws, government, culture and social order that can differ from one another by a lot. Just like today's countries some have merciless dictators North Korea and some have democracy to an extent where citizens can choose their own head of government UK. Furthermore, each planet itself is actually quite independent to the extent where they can have their own armed forces and even wage their own civil wars. Due to this, the Imperium only cares when some serious shit happens like Xenos invasion, corruption by oh god what the fuck eldritch horrors from beyond space and time. Or when a planetary governor decided to declare himself independent of the Imperium. And given that this is the Imperium, these kinds of things vary from happening by on a regular basis to not seeing an actual war for multiple millennia. Of course, in a few cases where a planetary governor or planet does declare independence, it is usually listed as heresy. However most governors don't do this kind of thing because they know what's out there and that the Imperium is the only thing that can protect them. Because the god emperor of mankind and the system of the Adeptus Astra Telepathica provides a cheap system of FTL and communication through the horrors of the war. And because the merchant fleet enables intergalactic commerce. If a planet declares independence, he loses the right to FTL and trade with the Imperium. And that's bad for hive worlds that need agri worlds in order to survive. Meaning the Imperium doesn't even need to send in their military since they know that the young usurper would most likely peacefully surrender in that prospect. The reason why the loyalty of some planets differ in question varied over the Imperium's history. During the Great Crusade, most worlds were extremely loyal to both the Imperium and the Emperor because it rescued them from all sorts of indescribable horrors that had plagued them for the thousands of years of the long, Night Age of Strife. After the Great Crusade, the Imperium remained mostly cohesive as a whole due to both a remaining sense of loyalty to their savior and for mutual survival in the face of a severely fucked up galaxy. After a few thousand years of that, the Imperial cult had gained sufficient strength that the reasons for remaining loyal to the Imperium and the Emperor expanded from just mutual survival to a shared religion where loyalty between each planet must be routinely checked to prevent separatism or another civil war that essentially kicked the Imperium in the galactic nuts. However, even then, some religious Ashat decides to do it all over again for the lulz. The aftermath of which persuaded some planetary rulers to question the legitimacy and thus loyalty to the Imperium. This is why you see that although most planets would never dare to even break away from the Imperium, a certain few that do break away is either due to the above questioning, your typical chaos hijinks, Xenos manipulation as is frequently the case when the TAU or Jena Stila cults are involved, or just a planetary governor who's either arrogant enough to think he can get away with it or desperate enough to believe his world has nothing to lose from rebellion. Therefore, the loyalty of most to the Imperium is not out of an ideological obsession to stamp out heresy, but of pragmatism and necessity in order to survive in the grim darkness of the 41st millennium as protectorates. This real life perspective again, is then supported in WH40K where the Imperium, being a decentralized but powerful semi-autonomous group of corporate entities, have different ways of pledging allegiance to the Emperor himself rather than the state. The Inquisition stamps out anyone caught separating from or perverting the Emperor's rule of conduct as heresy. The Adeptus Mechanicus worships the Emperor as an aspect of another pagan machine god called the Omnitia and benefits from an ancient pact of alliance dating to the Great Crusade. And the Adeptus Astartes are altered transhumans who merely view the Emperor as an exemplar of humanity. 
but were created by the emperor himself and so can claim a closer connection to him than the other above mentioned organizations via their genetic descent from the primarchs. They all might just as well declare each other's ideologies as heresy but each of them are personal protectorate vassals to the emperor himself, and both know that they need to work together lest humanity as a whole goes extinct. Thus, as said multiple times before, the Imperium is not a centralized superstate, and more akin to a coalition of confederated mini-empires that's disguised as a galactic superpower though the Imperium has its independent military and technological might with which to enforce its laws, or in real life examples, the Imperium is more of a mixture between the protectorate system like the Roman Empire, which allowed local governments to exist as protectorates as long as they pay taxes and say that the Emperor is all good and dandy, and today's UN which allows member nations to join while still keeping their national cultural dignity, along with the veto powers between the founding members of China, US, Russia, France and Britain so they can keep each other's powers in balance similar to the equal powers between the High Lords of Terror. Additionally, while chastity and prudence are technically heralded as virtues by some organizations and planets within the Imperium, the Imperium as a whole is decidedly pro-sex. The reason is more utilitarian than hedonistic, more babies means more soldiers. Even in the smallest sectors, there are always more planets to colonize even if it's on the ruins of some other civilization so space is seldom a concern. Imperial citizens are encouraged, by most local customs, to be fruitful so that the tithes may be paid. If you'd ask why not just clone more soldiers? The reason the Imperium doesn't do that at least excluding their black projects like the Ephriel strain soldiers is because it's considered a perversion of the holy human form, hence it's labeled as heresy. Plus, attempting to clone regiments of soldiers on a rapid basis is likely to come with a variety of genetic problems that would hinder the Imperium rather than help it. Then there's the problem that the technology to clone a full human with a functioning mind as opposed to a brain-dead clone fit for making into a servitor is extremely difficult. To say nothing of how the clone souls seem to be inherently abnormal for reasons nobody can explain. And if anyone still complains that the Imperium is still dark and miserable, just shove Stephen Baxter's Zeely sequence down their throats. Portraying a human empire that is so downright evil and malicious that you will actually applaud their cosmic butt whipping by the night god like Zeely. Seriously. The interim coalition of governance is what happens when the marines malevolent becomes a pan-galactic empire that has no qualms in sending over 200 trillion child soldiers to die in a rather hopeless and pointless war. They make the policies of the Imperium look like the United Federation of Planets in comparison. A sprawling Imperial city that ships around 2 kilometers long, by the way. In Rogue Trader, anyway. In the novels more like 10 to 20. Imperium of man in contrast to true totalitarian regimes. Whilst it is true that the Imperium of man combines many elements from all of the dictatorships on earth, the key word you are looking for is elements. All of the dystopian tropes in the arm are nitpicks from great dystopian classics, they aren't a true mixture of various authoritarian tropes, but are mere themes to set up the atmosphere of the Imperium. The presence of authoritarianism is there alright. However, it is not outright enforced. The Imperium doesn't care how your planet is run as long as the tithes come in on time and there's no outright heresy to be found. Imperial law focuses on best practices, security against subtle enemy attack methods, and anti-chaos related manners of thinking like a distinct lack of questioning the unknown because it could enter you and play havoc with your world. Basically, as long as you have laws that don't leave you wide open for the horrors in space, the Imperium is fine with you. And as mentioned before, the dystopian elements varies between planets to planets with the fact that you could actually leave the planet if given money and time. The reason why places like Oceania from 1984, North Korea and the aforementioned interim coalition of governments are terrifying is because it is actually a true totalitarian government with an extremely nihilistic attitude. These are totalitarian regimes done horrifyingly right. They are governments which lavish and prides itself in its malevolence and power, in which you have little to no chance in leaving the hell hole you are born in. Their governmental and ideological structure is done in such a way that the mere act of pragmatism will be outed for heresy. Places like these are concentrated in true dystopias in which control is so absolute that you live in a personal prison for all eternity. So it is of no surprise that these governments makes the raging incompetence of the Imperium look like Fantasia. Furthermore, the Imperium has one thing these governments do not have nor will ever show a sense of humanity and heroism. Throughout all the works made by GW on the Imperium, we have characters who show remarkable amount of selfless heroism. 
courage and intense humanity to protect the weak against all odds. You do not or barely see any of this selflessness and manly tears in the aforementioned works. This is why 1984 and the Zeely sequence is so horrifying. There is no hope, no epics, no grandeur. Just a collapsing reality where such ideas like humanity is considered a non-existent joke. Essentially, what we are trying to say here is that the worst thing the Imperium can do is not out of malice, but out of desperation, incompetence and necessity. For example, we are forced to commit exterminatus on a billion souls because we have no choice and the alternative outcome would be much worse. I pray that these innocent souls would meet peace with the Emperor. In contrast this with Oceania which go along the lines of, we torture you not because of some politically motivated means or a necessary evil, we do so because we want to exercise our power, we do so because we can, or the interim coalition of governments. We are ready to send over a untold number of kids to die against the Zeely. Why you ask? Because it is more economically viable to protect our sweet, sweet Moolah and we need something to cover up our deep insecurities and spite. Reading this and you will realize how much the I'm embody not perpetual evil and suffering for its own sake, but one of desperate measures taken in desperate times. Exacerbated further by inefficiency and human error. It may be shit by our standards. But when you consider all the other alternatives that would actually stand a chance in the grim darkness of the far future it's pretty clear the Imperium is the least horrible alternative for humanity by far. In summation, to put it simply, the Imperium is more or less a feudal society rather than an empire in the modern sense like is seen in Star Wars or a thousand other science fiction space fantasy stories. You have a central authority in the Adeptus Terra and a unifying religion and the Imperial Greed, but the assorted fiefdoms of the Imperium generally are left to rule themselves without that much oversight from the central authority as long as the taxes come in on time and no open rebellion is occurring. Given that the Imperium is 40k's counterpart to the Empire in Warhammer Fantasy which is more or less the medieval renaissance era Holy Roman Empire but bigger and more technologically advanced. This isn't all that surprising. And much like those feudal era societies you have some parts which are much better off than others. In agriculturally rich land with ample access to trade and developed cities feudal societies could rival anything that the earlier societies of antiquity could make in terms of sophistication. But poor provinces mostly made out of useless swampland and rocks are of course going to be poor hick towns somehow their ancestors thought settling in said swamp and rocks was a brilliant idea. Furthering the parallels to feudal Europe is that the Imperium is built atop of the corpse of an older and more urbane society. Rome for medieval Europe and Dark Age humanity for the Imperium, and emerged out of a prolonged Dark Age following the collapse of that old empire. And the most important thing to note is that feudal governments did not exercise absolute control. For a feudal peasant your local baron had far more influence over your life than the king or emperor would, and how harsh or kind your life was depended largely on the nature of your local overlord. Similarly, some places would have elected heads of local government like mayors in many cities, some would be ruled directly by the church. And even the laws and customs could vary dramatically between the domains of the various nobles. In essence, the Imperium is a space medieval society that due to the original generation of games workshop writers being history nerds with degrees and shit, actually resembles a medieval society much better than stories supposedly set in faux medieval times. The Imperium has much more in common with the Empire of Charlemagne during the Great Crusade or the Holy Roman Empire than it does with any of the expansionist and or authoritarian regimes that arose from the 1700s and onwards. You could also hand the wine as the Cyphers Kane books, which repeatedly showcases imperial worlds that are actually fairly decent places to live, with planetary governments that actually give a shit about their people, and are perfectly capable of surviving an invasion or two or several. In the case of orc threats and still returning to a state of normalcy after the organizations whose purpose is to deal with these threats does their jobs who, by the way, 8 times out of 10 are usually able to do so without leaving the planet in question a smoking ruin. Space feudalism is even implied in the way the people in the law speak of the Imperium. For instance, a politician might tell his fellow watch what you say or the Imperium will come or something. The Imperium is an outsider to most of the worlds it is made of, not an immediate presence. Too Lonf didn't read the Imperium of Man has more in common with the United Federation of Planets in terms of government structure than it does with the Galactic Empire. They're allowed to rule with relative independence, as long as they pay their tithes and obey the imperial cult. This does, of course, lead to many worlds being shitholes ruled by greedy homicidal tyrants, but there are plenty of examples of peaceful and even prosperous worlds, 
It really depends on galactic location and just chance. As long as you're not a Xenos race or attempt to cut ties with the Empyrean, you have a chance of living a comfortable life. And with millions of worlds with trillions of people inhabiting them, those chances might actually be decent. The vast majority of worlds are civilized worlds also known as Imperial Worlds, but that is a stupid and confusing name so fuck that and the vast majority of civilized worlds are quite pleasant places to be and are still pretty much what the Great Crusade created barring the addition of the Imperial Creed over the Imperial Truth. Most of the Grimdark happens on a handful of worlds in the Imperium and even then only specific spots like the Underhive of a particularly harsh hive world. For all but a minuscule number of humans, life in the Imperium really is pretty great. You have a guaranteed job that is not going to hurt you, unlike working on a forge world. A higher standard of living than a modern first world country civilian technology is quite advanced still since nearly every world produces it so it can't really be lost. Unlike advanced military tech, easy access to extremely cheap transportation, etc. So, as long as you can dodge the draft into the guard, You'll be totally good until the commissar or local priest comes looking for you for dodging. Summary. In the grim dark future of the 41st millennium, there is only bleak, grim, black, hopeless, dismal, barren, gloomy, grey, joyless, dur, dreary, dark, cheerless, glum, oppressive, somber, grim darkness, and a sugar beet cane is extinct. What the Imperium would likely look like if the Mechanicus ever decided to get their head out of their collective ass. Except there would be skulls and gothic architecture everywhere which is automatically superior in every way to stupid shiny smooth shit. Ah, much better. So it turns out it's not as cut and dry as people would have you believe what life would be like in the Imperium. Like, yeah, it's pretty fucking shit. It's not great. Um, living in a universe where orcs and tyranids and fucking necrons and, like, fucking... Jesus Christ, Dark Eldar, like, you know, it's just, it doesn't seem like a fun universe. Um, I'm sure you could have a generally relatively good life, but... Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm just not picking it. I'm I'm gonna have to pass on that wonderful opportunity. Uh, but no, I thought this pointed out a few bits. Of, a lot of people like you know, overlook. I think when it comes to 40k, that sometimes it's not always as bad as what people would have it believe. But uh, no, as I say, I haven't done a wee lore article in a wee while, and I do love my 1D4 channel. I always say this at the end of these ones, if you haven't went on 1D4 channel and just got lost on it, do it. I love it. Um, it's part of the reason why I do these, is because I would sometimes try and send my mates like, links to 1D4 channel articles, and they would just never read them. You know what I mean? It's like, nah, I can't. it's like, for fuck's sake, mate, come on, it's a great website. Honestly, I really recommend, after you finish watching this video, if you're not going to watch any of my other videos, go ahead, go on. Find some of yourself, some amazing stuff out there. Um, I'm thinking next I'm probably going to be covering the Bad Up Wars since I do play Space Sharks. So I'm a bit biased in that regards, but look, we'll just see what happens. I've got a few things on the table. I know you guys are going to enjoy them. We'll just have to wait and see. But hey, look, um, as always, subscribe, check out the Discord. Actually, while you're on the, oh, I'm on the topic of the Discord, you should check out a link down below, a Flea Manor Knots. Um, he made a trailer for me. Uh, from a Discord. I thought it was a lot of fun. I thought it was fucking hilarious. Um, go check that out if you get the chance. But hey, look, I'll see you about. All right. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. Just stop. Just stop it. Stop. No. Just stop it.